All right, hello and welcome to a new week. This week is about sets and set theory. It's a very exciting concept. And sadly, there are some new symbols to learn. So uh, look forward to that, right? Uh, I wanna first start with some history because sets and set theory are very, very popular in mathematics. The actual goal of them, the reason they were made, was that we wanted a way to define and formalize all of mathematics with some kind of underlying theory. And set theory, was the strong contender of its day, okay? It's still the, the main one these days, even. So the goal of sets was to define all of mathematics with them all the way down to like one plus one equals two, and they did that, all right? So Georg Cantor was a very, very important person in this field. He, uh, a bit, he was a big proponent of set theory, and we just want, he wanted some way for all the mathematicians to talk about what they're working on so that they can understand each other. A common language, that's what set theory is, and we are all the better for it, okay? So let's talk about what sets are. It's a very vague concept when you first start hearing about it, but uh, the more I talk about it and the more examples I give, it should make more sense, okay? So a set really is, mathematically, just a collection of things, a collection of objects. Think of it like a bag that you can put stuff inside, and no, really, uh, the things that you put in a mathematical set can be anything. They could legitimately be, you can make a set or consider a set of all the green M&Ms in the universe or on Earth, okay? That is a completely valid set to make. All right, so uh, weird, huh? If you have things in a set, you can talk about them. Uh, the things that you put inside of a set are called elements. So the stuff inside your bag of stuff, those are called elements. And the way that we talk about or define what sets are and what they contain, uh, one way to do that is roster notation. So like you're calling out the role in a class, everybody on the roster, right? So that's when you just list all the things that are inside with some squiggly braces. That is set notation. Okay, so here's a set called A that holds one, two, three. Here's a set called B that holds two, four, six, eight. So the, the style is you give a name to the set, you draw some squiggly braces, and then you put whatever you want inside of that set, and those are the elements. Okay, so C's elements go here. Not too bad, right? Uh, the, the key key thing about sets is that repetition doesn't matter at all. It's just is something in the set or is something not in the set. So the set with one and three twos really is just the set one, two, because uh, all those twos get squished down into just one element. Okay, repetition, clones of things uh, do not affect the set. All right. So if you put stuff in a set, we need to be able to talk about what's in it. So uh, there is a symbol for something is an element of a set. So like one is the element of this example set, one is an element of the set. So we can write it with the Greek epsilon symbol, I think, uh, and that is pronounced as in. So that's the set A, A holds one, two, three. And I can talk about one being inside of that set with this symbol, one is in A, we can say. Okay, so so is two and so is three, they're both in A, but four is not in A, right? Four is like out here. So we say not in with a little slash. Okay, so those are the fancy symbols. And if you have a set of stuff, uh, you can also consider a set of no stuff. So you can have the empty set and you can draw that either with just squiggly braces with nothing inside or uh, as like an O with a slash through it. Okay, so like here's B, you can define B to be the empty set and it's just a bag of nothing, all right? Uh, there's a difference between finite sets and infinite sets, of course. So A here is a finite set. It holds a finite number of things. If you want to get technical, that just means that you can find a number n. You can count the elements, right? And there's a number n where you stop counting, right? That means it's finite. And then an infinite set is, of course, when you can't count all the elements. There is no number that you can stop counting on. You have to go forever. You've got to pass through all the numbers. So here's like an infinite set. A lot of the time you draw it with ellipses. So this is meant to be the set of all the positive integers, for example. Okay, it goes on forever. So that's infinite. Uh, and if you have a finite set, you might want to talk about how many things are inside of it. Like this A set has three elements, three things inside of it, and that uh, that's called the cardinality of the set. Okay, so you use like the little absolute value symbol to say that this is the cardinality of my set. It is three, that's how many elements are inside of it. Okay, so. There are three elements in the set A, that is the notation. And the fancy word for how many elements is the cardinality. Okay. We have some very important sets that we like to consider a whole lot of the time. Okay. 
So we made fancy, fancy looking symbols for them. A cool looking N and a cool looking Z to start. All right. Uh, I will draw this N like this. Okay. N is called the set of natural numbers. It's an infinite set. Uh, both of these are infinite sets, by the way. So the set of natural numbers is defined to be all the integers greater than or equal to zero. All right. So that's just the set starting at zero, zero, then one, then two, on and on and on until the end of time. That is the natural numbers, all the non-negative numbers. Okay. Some uh, books or mathematicians are taught and like to think that the natural numbers start at one instead of zero, but uh, they're just wrong. Okay. We're computer scientists. We start at zero. That's how it should be. Uh, this is actually, uh, this. you can start a fight w between mathematicians by asking whether or not zero is in the natural numbers or not. Uh, in this class, we say that it is, okay? And this cool looking font is called uh, Blackboard Bold, if you care. Uh, really, it's supposed to be just a bold N, and so you'll see that in your book. But uh, nobody's going to draw N like this. It takes way too long for me to do that on my little virtual whiteboard. So obviously, I'm going to I'm going to draw it like this instead. Okay, so that's how this font came to be, uh, if you care. And then, uh, so that's the natural numbers. We also have the set of all the integers, so all the positive and negative integers, and also zero. And we define that to be uh, the symbol called Z. All right, so I'll draw that like that. That's my blackboard bold Z. And that's just the set of all the integers. The reason it's a Z, like N for numbers, right? It's Z for a German word, for Zahlen, which just means numbers. Okay, so there you go. Uh, so that's Z. And you can put a little superscript on the Z to define some fancier things, like uh, if you want the set of just the positive integers, because that's not N, right? Uh, then you can say Z plus, okay? And that is just all the positive elements of the set Z, okay? So that's Z in a nutshell. That's Z and N. Cool, hun. We'll see those forever. Uh, two more sets. I'm sorry we have to get through all this notation before we can actually do cool stuff with sets. I apologize. It's just the way it has to be. Uh, we also have Q and R. All right. So Q, Q for quotient, right? Q stands for all of the rational numbers. It's the set of every rational number ever. Okay. Set of all elements A over B, where A and B are in C. Isn't that cool? A and B are in Z. They're just integers. And B is not zero because you can't divide by zero. So it's Q for quotient. You'll see it in bold in your book. And so all of these numbers are rational numbers, right? Don't be fooled by this one. It's just 523 over 100, right? Uh, these are all ratios of integers, even zero, just zero over whatever. So rational numbers is a set of all those things. And then we have the set of all real numbers, which you may have heard before. And we can define this very fancily in saying, like, the set R, which is all the real numbers, that is, well, it's all the rational numbers too, of course, because those count. And then it's all the irrational numbers as well, so the set of those, right? So it's everything in Q, but more. It's a bigger set, even though it's also infinite. Uh, so it's got all these things, all these things, but it also has things like pi and square root of 2, okay? So that is the real numbers. We call that R, okay? So in your book, it's always going to be bold, but I'll write it using this blackboard bold style. Okay, so we have our N, Z, Q, and R, and it, it's good to memorize those. So I'll be writing them like N, Z, Q, and R. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost to some examples where we can actually use sets. We just need even more notation. I know. Uh, let's talk about how to make sets when we don't want to list things. Okay. You can use this thing called set builder notation. Okay, uh, a lot of the times you want to start with a certain starting set and the, then just pick out elements of that set that you care about. Okay, so you can use the set builder notation for that, where uh, we write it like this. Sometimes you'll see a, a little pipe character. Sometimes you'll see a colon. Doesn't matter either way. But you read this as okay. Define A to be the set of all the, the elements x and s where. P of x is true about that element, okay? Set of all x's in s such that P of x is true. So it filters out some of the elements of s, which is big, probably. They don't all satisfy P. We just want the ones that do, okay? 
So you can also use the little pipe symbol. So here's the set B of all the even integers, right? Start with all the elements X in Z, all the normal integers, and then pick out the ones that are even. You see how that's filtering them, and that's useful to do? So that's set builder notation. Uh, and sometimes when we're talking about things, we, uh, we want to consider what's called a universal set as well. So in this case, Z might be the universal set. That's everything that we're talking about. We're filtering out things from. So uh, you might hear this called U, the universal set. It's just the set of all the things that uh, we're considering, all the things that we're mentioning in a particular context, which is, again, very vague, but uh, it will make sense with examples, OK? So uh, for example, if we're talking about integers and things that could be true about them, then the universe, like or sometimes called the universe of discourse, the thing that we're really talking about is z, right? We're talking about the integers, and we're filtering things out of them. So the universal set for that context is z itself. Again, it will make more, more sense with examples, I promise. And uh, here's something I don't have to teach you, something you already know. Yay, we got here. This is called uh, a Venn diagram. We know about those. A and B, those could be sets. They're really just sets, aren't they? So A could be 1, 2, 3, right? and B can be 2, 3, 4. And we can draw a Venn diagram to show what they have in common. Isn't that nice? So uh, when you learned about Venn diagrams, you were really doing set theory this whole time. And yeah, so sometimes you'll hear this be called universe of discourse. And that's all I want to say there. Uh, just like you can, can have elements of a set, you can talk about if one set contains another. And I'll draw Venn diagrams for this. And that is called subsets, OK? So here's an example of a subset. Here's A and B. A is a subset of B if when something's an element of A, it implies that it's an element of B, too. X is an A if it's in B. That's what it means to be a subset. One is smaller than the other, or equal to. So here's A, 1, 2, 3. And here's B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. See how it contains A? So A, we say, is a subset of B, just like that. That's the symbol that we use. It's kind of like a, a curvy less than or equal to symbol, which makes sense. Every element of A is also an element of B. That's what it means to be a subset. Oops, sorry about my emails. Maybe I should close that. All right, so this and this also satisfy the definition of being a subset, OK? So if A is equal to B, A is still a subset of B. If A is equal to the empty set, the empty set is always like squiggly less than or equal to B, right? Nothing is always inside of something. So those just uh, are things we can remember. And uh, yeah, we write it like this. A is a subset of B. All right, very similar to this. And it's meant to, to make you think about this symbol. That one came first. OK, uh, sometimes you want to specify that a subset that you have <coughs> excuse me, is strictly smaller than another one, OK? So A is called a proper subset of B, and we write it without that little equal sign mark to say that every element of A is an element of B, and also A is not equal to B, OK? So you see its similarity to this. We write it like this. A is a proper subset of B, OK? So that's how we write that. And so for example, this particular A and this particular B, they satisfy that. Right? A is strictly a proper subset of B, OK? And then you can, of course, reverse the symbol and say that uh, A is a superset of B, like this, and that we just define to be B is a, a subset of A, right? It's just you flip the, the symbols, OK? And I think you understand what proper superset means as well. So all of these things that I've just written here are true, and I encourage you to look at them and understand them. So A is a subset of B. It's got all the elements. A is also a subset of C, even though they're equal, OK? The em empty set is always a subset of A. A is strictly a proper subset of B, because it's got fewer elements, not equal. Uh, the empty set is a proper subset of B as well, because it's smaller and not equal to. 
A is not a proper subset of C, because they're equal. C is a superset of A, no problem. That's just the same as saying this, just flipped around. And then B is a proper, sub, uh, proper superset, excuse me, of A. It's got more things. OK? Isn't that nice? So this is the main uh, fancy definition of subset, and I hope you see why it corresponds to this English sentence. OK? That's important. And uh, that's actually, because we have this logical definition, that's how we're going to prove that uh, sets are subsets of each other or equal to, OK? Because you can just do it twice. Let me show you this. So pretend that A and B are sets. A is equal to B when A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, right? Does that make sense? That's only ever true if they're equal to each other. A has all of B's elements, and B has all of A's elements. That's how you can read that. The only way for them to both be true at the same time is if those sets were equal to, right? And if you want to prove this using logic, you could expand the definitions of what does it mean to be a subset. So you could bring this into play and do it twice, right? For all x, this is true one way and the other way. And you know what a uh, conjunction of implications are, one in each direction. That's just a double implication a biconditional, OK? A is equal to B when, for all x, x is in A if and only if x is in B. That is set equality, OK? We'll get to that more when we prove things like that. But uh, I wanted to show you that now. I wanted to derive this. It'll make it clear when we give an example of it, OK? So we're finally ready for examples. It, it just took so long, I'm sorry. But we needed to get here, all right? So let's talk about things. I want you to try this. Here are two sets. A is 1, 2, 3. And B is the following set using set builder notation. It's all the x's in Z, which are the integers, right? Such that x is an integer multiple of 42. It's a special element of Z. You see that? OK, so now I want you to think about all of these questions. And then we will come back and talk about them. So give them all a try. OK. So the first question is, is 1 an element of A? Is 1 somewhere in A? Yeah, it's right there. So the answer is yes. Is 5 an element of A? No. This is set builder notation. I don't see a 5 anywhere. So no, it's not there. 5 is not, oops, not an element of A. OK. So uh, we have to think about, hey, now, is this a subset of B? And we might first want to consider, like, what, what are the elements of B, right? What are some example elements? So an integer multiple of 42. So 0 is an integer multiple of anything. 42 is an integer multiple of 42. It's just 42 times 1, right? 84 is a multiple. Uh, so are the negatives. Still an integer. Negative 1 times 42, right? Negative 42 negative 84, on and on and on forever, right? So that's B. You might actually see this written. It's easier to write it sometimes, or to think about it, if you write it like this. This is an alternate set builder notation for B, equal to. Uh, it's just every 42 times x uh, for every x in Z. You see how that's equivalent? Isn't that cute? So this might help you think about it as well. Uh, but now we're, we're asking, is the set with just 42 and 84 in it, a subset of B. And yeah, those are both there. They're both elements. And so everything here is also in here. It's a subset, yes. All right, what about this one? Is the set 1, 2, 3 a proper subset? You see the difference? It's missing that. Missing that squiggle. Is 1, 2, 3 a proper subset of A, which is itself 1, 2, 3. And the answer is no, because it is equal to. It's not a proper subset, OK? But it would. It is a normal subset, OK? Subset or equal to kind of notation. That's the difference, OK? What about this one? What's the cardinality of A? Remember that symbol, that definition, that fancy word? And so it's just count the elements. 
one, two, three, there's three elements. Cardinality of A is three. Does that make sense? That's the idea there. That's where we're going. Uh, and let's see. Before I talk about the empty set anymore, there's a cute tweet that I found uh, d explain the difference between, uh, and this will come up weirdly enough, explain the difference between the empty set just by itself, so I can define A to be just the empty set, right, which holds nothing, nothing at all, uh, or I could define a set that contains the empty set, and those are not the same thing. So I could also write that like this, two squiggly braces around each other. And so here's a cute example of why uh, they're different. So here's the empty set. Whee. And then here is, um, here's a set containing the empty set. See how, see how it's inside? These are not equal to each other. And I guess I should use blue, sorry. Wee, this is this is the empty set, and this is the set containing the empty set, and those are not equal to each other. And this uh, this explanation was supposed to set us up for this thing called sets of sets and power sets, because like I've shown you, you can totally put a set inside of a set. That seems weird. Maybe I should have talked about this first, but uh, it was a good segue nonetheless. So you can totally put sets inside a set. So here is a set. I can define A to be this. It's a set, right, that contains another set, that contains another set inside of itself. So this is how I would draw A as like a Venn diagram, right? A contains the set one, two, the empty set, the set one, two, three, the set with just one in it. That is A. And so now symbols look weird because this is not a subset of A. This is an element of A. Do you see that? Isn't that weird? This is just something that's inside of A. It is now an element because the whole set is inside of A. Crazy. Zero, or sorry, not zero. The empty set is another element of the set A. Crazy. Notice that one, the number one, is not an element of A. These are the four elements of A. Do you see that? One is an element of one of the elements. It's an element of a few of the elements of A, but it itself is not in A. If one were in A, that would mean I'd put it here. Do you see the difference? That's key. Seems weird, I know, but you can have sets of sets, not a problem. And then uh, once you can have sets of sets, you can think about all the possible sets that you could make out of a set. So. Uh, that involves subsets, of course, right? So this is called the power set. And you can either see that spelled as two words or one word. Uh, I think I prefer to spell it as one. Uh, so a power set is the set of all the subsets of one, uh, one given set. So here's the, you can say the power set of A is a set of all the subsets that you can make out of A, okay? We write it as P of A a lot of the time, okay? It's shorter that way. So if here is our original set, if this is A, then the power set of A, the set of all subsets of A, is this. Well, the empty set is always a subset, right? You can have a set of just the individual elements on their own, right? The set of just one, the set of just two, the set of just three. Those are all subsets, right, of the original A, because this is A, right? One, two, three. That's key. Uh, this is the set containing one, right? Just like this one was the set containing one. And I want to just spell out that difference. Set containing one. And we learned that the set containing one is not equal to the number one. Okay? That's important. So you have to, if these are subsets, you have to use the set notation. This is a set of sets again. Okay? Another subset of A is just, okay, you can pick out the one, two. Put it there. Or you could pick out the one, three as a subset, right? Whoop, just go around the two. Uh, or the two, three. And then the whole set is also a subset of itself, right? It's not a proper, just a normal, regular subset with this notation. Okay, all of these are subsets of the original set A. So that's the power set of A, okay? 
And one nice thing you might notice is this has to get, uh, this goes into like uh, combinatorics, which we'll talk about later in this class, but the power set of A, the cardinality of it is always two to the power of the original set's cardinality. Does that make sense? So these, uh, this set has three elements, so the power set is always going to contain, uh, of a three element set, it's always going to contain eight elements, two to the three, right? Two, four, six, eight. Really always works, right? And my hand wavy proof of that, we'll get into it later in the class, is well, when you're constructing a subset, constructing all the possible subsets of an original set A, uh, you can either, when you're considering whether or not uh, to put an element inside of the current set you're working on, you have two options, right? You can either include it or not. Include it in the subset you're currently working on or not. And those are two options. And you have those two options for each element of A. And so that uh, ends up looking like that. Okay? But it's just uh, something that you can take as a fact for right now. Okay? Sets of sets and power sets. And so uh, now maybe this slide makes more sense even. Uh, you can have sets of sets and uh, they, do, they do look different, right? This is like one in the set containing one. Empty set and a set containing the empty set. You see the difference? All right, time for you to try out these new terms. So here are some sets. Let's start with, uh, let's do this one first, and we'll talk about its answer, and then we'll do the rest. So here's a set, call it x, okay? Tell me the cardinality. Tell me if two is in it. Tell me if the set two, three is a subset of the set x. Tell me if five, six, seven is in x, okay? So work on that, and then I'll talk about the answers with you. So here's x, right? x is the set containing 1, containing the set 2, 3, different from just 2 and 3 by itself, right? It contains 4, and then it contains the set 5, 6, 7. You see that? Looks weird, but that's what we're specifying. So first thing to ask is what is the cardinality? That's how many elements. Notice that it's not 7, right? These, are, these come as one package. These are chunks. They're considered to be a single element. So the number of elements of x is 1, 2, 3, 4. Can you see that? Cardinality of x is 4. Oops. Then you can ask, hey, is 2 in x? Is 2 an element of x? And no, it's not. It's an element of one of the elements, but it is not an element. That would have to be something like this. It's not there. Okay? What about... Uh, is 2, 3 a subset of x, right? What do you think for that one? Is 2, 3 a subset of x? I see 2, 3 right here. I see the set 2, 3 right here. But the answer is no. Did you get that? Because uh, this is not true. What is true is the set 2, 3 is an element of x. This is where you have to get very, very particular. This is true, right? But this is not. It's not a subset. Because if you're trying to say this, if you're saying that that is a subset of x, that implies, right, that each of those are elements. Implies that 2 is an x and 3 is an x. And that is just not true, right? You see the difference between subset and element? That is probably the most important thing on this slide, okay? That difference. That's what I want you to see, all right? Then we can ask, is 5, 6, 7 the set in x? Is it an element of x? And yes, it is. It's right there, okay? Notice these two different questions. This one is yes, this one is no, okay? Very, very important. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to use this notation, you could... Uh, but you'd have to use, you'd have to do this. Uh, here's another way of saying this. That is true. Uh, the set containing the set two, three is in fact a subset of X. Does that make sense? Because this is an element of X. You see the difference? I encourage you to look back at the definitions, either on the slides or in your book, and notice why this is false, but this is true. Okay? All right. Let's talk about power sets now. And remember that power sets are just the set of all subsets of a given set. All right. So what is the power set of the set containing 8, 9, and 10? So think about that. 
and then I'll draw my answer. So right away, how many elements better the power set have? 2 to the n, 2 to the size of the original set, so 2 to the 3, it's going to be 8 again. Okay. So the power set of the set 8, 9, 10 is first, we always have the empty set, and that's always a subset of any set. Uh, then we have the set containing just 8. And this class always gets me practiced with my drawing squiggly braces. So these are all the one element subsets of the set 8, 9, 10, right? You have just 8, just 9, just 10. And then you have the two element sets. You have uh, you got 8, 9, you have 8, 10, and then you have 9, 10. And then you finally get um, the set with all of them, 8, 9, and 10, and that's all 8. Okay, so those are the, the 8 elements of the power set, every possible subset of this original set here. Okay, the next one's a bit trickier. Th see if you can figure it out. What is the power set, the power set of the power set of the empty set? Crazy, huh? So first of all, before you get tripped up about this, uh, I want you to first think about the cardinality of what this has to be, and then that might help you find the answer. Okay, so give that a try. And then, uh, assuming you're back now, let's talk about it. So let's do the first one. Let's do the inner one, the power set of just the empty set. What is the cardinality of that? Right? How many elements should that have? This still works. It's defined to be this. So the power set of the empty set, the cardinality of that is 2 to the size of the original set, the size of the empty set, which is 0. So that tells us that the cardinality of the power set of the empty set better be 2 to the 0, because 0 is the size of the empty set. There's nothing in it. So that's 1. Oh, man. The power set of that now, power set of a set with one thing in it, you see where I'm going with that? Cardinality of this now, we can compute. Because it's just the uh, power set of a set of one element, now that we know that, which is going to be 2 to the 1, right? So that's 2. We know that this has two elements now, OK? So let's think about it. So the power set of the empty set, just by itself, that has one element. Uh, what element is always a subset of any set? Well, that's the empty set. So the only element of the power set of the empty set is the empty set. That's the only possible subset of nothing, right? That makes sense. And it's the one element, the only possible element that we could have, OK? But once you have this now, once you take the power set of this, remember that there's a difference between the set, the empty set, and the set containing the empty set. Now we have two elements. We can have a second, right? The power set of the power set of the empty set has two elements. It's all the subsets of this set. Okay. So, of course, you can take nothing from this set, right? You can take nothing. So the empty set is always a subset. But you could also take the subset containing the empty set, Ooh, which is the whole thing. You could always take the whole thing as well, right? You could always take nothing and the whole thing, right? That's this all over again. You could always take nothing and the whole thing, which is not the same. We you see how the we have a set containing the empty set and a set containing the empty set. Do you see the difference? So the power set of the power set of the empty set is the em a set containing the empty set and also inside of that another set containing the empty set. Okay? That's very hard to say in English, but it should make sense now that I've written it. And this is a very ugly empty set, so may, let me redraw that. Does that make sense? Please yell at me about this. If this is confusing, this is very important. Okay? These multiple power sets, and power sets of the empty set as well, these get important. So if you were to take the power set once more, I encourage you to think about what the elements might be, what the size of that would have to be. Very weird to think about. All right. Let's check how we're doing on our time here. Uh, and then let's talk about union and intersection. All right. So, uh, these are very, very, very common symbols, and they are going to make a lot of sense, okay? You already know these things. 
I promise. There are more Venn diagram operations. So uh, you might want to union some sets together. It's a little U for union. That's the symbol. And that's when you join two sets into a bigger one that contains all of their individual elements combined. Okay? So uh, a union B is defined to be all the X's, all the elements uh, that were either in A or they were in B. Isn't that nice? It contains el all the elements that are in either A or B or in both. That's quite nice to have. So for example, if this is A and this is B, their union is the whole thing. Right, so here's A, it's 1, 2, 3, and B is 2, 3, 4. Whee. So A union B is everybody. It's all that. We. You see that? A union B equals 1, 2, 3, 4. Isn't that nice? All right, so that's one way to do things. Uh, you can combine all the elements. That's set union. Not too bad, I hope. You can also intersect two sets. That's set intersection. And what that does is that takes out all the common elements of two sets. Okay, all the common elements. So a intersect b is just the upside down union, right? It kind of. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, a intersect B is defined to be all the elements X that are both in A and B. Okay, they have to both be there. They have to share that element. It's all the shared elements. So A intersect B contains all elements that are in both A and B, all the shared things. Let's write that. All the stuff they have in common. So if A is again 1, 2, 3, and B is 2, 3, 4, what's A intersect B? All the stuff that they have in common. That's just the 2, 3, right? So let's see if I can take this, copy, paste, delete this. A intersect B is going to be, give myself some room there, all the stuff they have in common. It's going to be this. See that? They share those things, and only those things. This is A intersect B. That's equal to just 2, 3. Only the stuff that they had in common. Boop and boop. Okay? Does that make sense? And another very useful thing to help you remember these symbols is set union looks like or. And it's defined using or. Set intersection looks like and, and it's defined using and. Isn't that nice? So uh, there's a reason we, we use the same look and symbols. And this is why. Okay? So that's union and intersection, and let me, let me give you some uh, practice with them. Let's try this. So let, let's let A be the set 1, 2, 3, and B be the set 3, 4, 5, and C be the set 2, 4, 6. All right? What is A union B, A intersect B, and A union B intersect C? So you've got to make this one first, right? Make this set first and then union it with A. So try all three of these, and then I'll do it with you. Okay, so uh, what is A union B? It's just all the stuff that they have in common. So if there's an element of either, it becomes part of the union. So one is in A, so one is totally in A union B. Same with two and three, right? Three is in both, doesn't matter. I'm just picking out of either of them. I'm taking them both and combining them, right? And then I can take four and five as well from B. It is what they have in total. So A union B is all of those things. Those are all the elements that either A or B or both have. Okay, that's the union, just combining these sets. And remember, there's no duplication. So three, two threes just makes one three. And now what about A intersect B? Okay, what was that? That's all the things that they have in common. So they don't share a one, they don't share a two. Do they share a three? Yes. It's just the set containing three. Okay. Because that's the only thing they, they share. The, the ones and twos and fours and fives, those aren't in both. Okay, so that's the intersection. And then let's do this one. What is A union B intersect C? Well, we got to do this one first because it's in parentheses. So let's do B intersect C first. What do they share? 
They don't share a 2. They do share a 4. Um, and they don't share a 6. Okay, So it's just the set containing 4. And then I need to union this with A, which is 1, 2, 3. So it's everything in A and everything in B intersects C. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4. Do you see that? Does that make sense to us? That is unions and intersections. Isn't that nice? Hopefully that makes enough sense. This is uh, pretty logical, these operations, I would say, compared to the other ones that we learned about. Hopefully that's not too bad. Uh, and I think, yeah, this is a good time to stop. I don't want to overload you with more stuff. I want you to go back and think about all this stuff that we learned, a lot of new symbols and terms. And so I'll cut the lecture a bit earlier today, a few minutes earlier, just so that you can go back and think about what they all mean and review. Okay? So I'll see you in the next one.